Welcome to Reality TV, your source for snarky reality TV recaps of all the shows we love and love to hate. From TLC to MTV, a and &E to Bravo and more, no show is off limits to the truth as I see it, all from the couch just like you. I'm Jody, your inner voice and best friend who says all the things you're thinking, but you have the manners to never say aloud. Be sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss a week and find me everywhere at Reality TV Pod. Support the show and score some amazing perks and merch, as well as some bonus episodes at Patreon dot com slash reality tv pod now sit back it's time to get salty hey guys i'm back i know i was gonna take the week off and only post a patreon episode but listen there are two things that are tugging at my heart and my gut this week and this is my way to try to turn just a crazy couple weeks for myself into, you know, doing something positive, paying it forward. Before I jump into 90 Day Fiance the other way and smothered, you're going to have to check out patreon.com slash realitybpod to get your 90 Day Fiance happily ever after this week. I'm going to tell you about this man named Dave Bulger. I came across Dave's Twitter when our friend Melissa from Moms and Murder Podcast retweeted it, and it says, please help. My wife Dawn needs a kidney transplant. Please help us find a donor. Dawn is a nurse of over 25 plus years and mommy to Trevor, who has Downs, CP, and autism. That is Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and autism. And listen, it is so easy to become a donor or even to get tested to see if you were to be a match. Melissa from Moms Murder Podcast can tell you a little bit more information about that, as well as our friend Kim from People Are Wild Podcast. If you are interested in it all, please reach out to Dave. Again, his Twitter and Instagram is B-O-L-G-5. You can also email him, B-O-L-G-5 at AOL.com, or call him at 630-918-8380. Again, 630-918-8380 retweet, repost, spread the word. You never know who's going to see it. If I were in a position to donate, I absolutely would. And you know, you never know what life has in store for you and you never know what reach you have. Now, the other thing that came up this week and actually, you know what? I believe it was last week and I have not stopped thinking about it because just something about it seems so unjust and I can't get it off my mind. I've been following the sweetest feminist on Instagram for quite some time. If you don't follow her, you absolutely need to, especially if you consider yourself a feminist or you just enjoy fun, pretty, cute art. So what Becca Ray Holloway behind the sweetest feminist does, she bakes these cakes and on top of the cakes, the way she decorates them is just so... Uh, it just draws you in. It really is art. You wouldn't necessarily think about it as art when you're first looking at it, but it is. And that's going to come into importance in just a moment. First, let me give you a couple examples of the cakes and sometimes cookies and pies that she decorates. They have messages that are feminist in nature or even just empowering in nature. So for example, one of them I'm looking at, it says, take me seriously or tell me what you're good at. Another one is incarceration should be irrelevant to voting eligibility. I know I'm getting political on you, but listen, I'm going to look at a cake right here that says, I ain't sorry. I ain't sorry about it. Now, what happened last week? I was looking at her Instagram, came up in my feed, and I see this photo of Miley Cyrus licking this cake that says, abortion is health care. Now, immediately when I saw that, my gut reaction was, oh my gosh, this Instagram person that I follow, I do not know this person, I wish I did, you know, they are getting featured, their art is getting out there. Well, no, that's not exactly what happened. And those of you who are creators of any form, whether it be, you know, a true artist per se, or you write music, or whatever your art is, if someone is stealing something so much to the point where, okay, well, hold on. I should probably back up here. Again, I don't know why I'm so passionate about this, but I am. I'm looking at the cake that the sweetest feminist, our artist, our original here, she made this cake that says abortion is healthcare with the exact sprinkles and colors and underlining, what do you call it, piping around the side. She made that and posted it in May 
2018. Miley Cyrus just posted this photo of her biting into the cake last week. Now, when the sweetest feminist reached out to Miley and was like, hey, interesting. I am not, you know, getting any credit for this. Funny that this should be an exact take off my cakes, my art. I'm really paraphrasing here. I'm apologizing, sweetest feminist, if I'm getting this wrong. Miley just responded with like, oh, I'll tag you on it. Well, people just went crazy and they're starting to troll or attack the sweetest feminist saying, well, it's just a cake. Relax. Anyone can make the cake. Well, if it were just a cake, why would Miley Cyrus be making this big statement with it and looking like she's naked, licking into it? All these other, you know, people tagging themselves like, thank you for the photographer and the uh, set designer and all this kind of shit. The centerpiece of this photo, this artistic photo, is her art. I just feel so aggravated that just because someone is maybe not as popular as Miley Cyrus or as photographer or whatever it is, it's just inexcusable to poo-poo someone or push them to the side because, oh, well, too bad. Sorry, it's just a cake. We're using it. I'll tag you. And then not even mention that you made a mistake or, yeah, we should really give credit to this artist. I don't know. I'm just getting really fired up about it. And it's just really pissing me off. You know, we got to get to a point where if someone is blatantly just ripping you off, you should be allowed to say something, especially when the point of the art is women's empowerment, right? Taking ownership in your body, in your creativity, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I need to settle myself down, maybe channel this anger, this frustration into this week's 90 Day Fiance the other way. Well, let's start off with Jenny. This episode was so fucking depressing with Jenny. I mean, never mind the eyebrow journeys aplenty. Jenny has got me all sorts of emotional. You know, I don't know what's wrong with me lately. I, I'm i rooting for her, and that shocks me because you know me. I rarely root for anyone on these shows, but she's absolutely right. Her clock is ticking, and you know, if you gotta say fuck it for the love you want, then I guess you just gotta do it and go for it. Now, on a superficial note, we gotta talk about Jenny's daughters because I actually find them gorgeous. Again, Eyebrow journeys aside, maybe a little too much makeup. They're beautiful. In her granddaughter, Annalisa, she's stunning. Like, beautiful, gorgeous, move over Hadid sisters. We got granddaughter Jenny from Palm Springs coming in hot. Now, jump to Samit, the man who is stealing all of our hearts. He's decided to lie to his family and say he's moving to Mumbai for a job and not that he's moving into a new apartment with Jenny in some other weird town. So we get to producers who are outside of his parents' house. It's like an apartment complex. There are cameras, people holding cell phones, making phone calls, a sound boom, and a man wearing a fake handlebar mustache. Uh, gee, I wonder why his family might think something is up. Way to go, American film crew. Now then, of course, we have Jenny, or at least I think it's Jenny, because at the end of that episode, I think someone was trying to, like, Mrs. Doubtfire us, because India Jenny looks drastically different than Palm Springs Jenny. Maybe she's buying makeup from Nicole and Asin's makeup store or something. Yes, I know it's a whole different country, but you know what I'm saying. Like, she looks very different from California Jenny. Anyhow, where we leave off, she's waiting at the airport while Samit, a.k.a. Samit, uh, remember when I told you guys that I thought she was saying the name wrong? Yeah, well, Samit slash Samit is MIA, and Jenny is all scared that he's not going to turn up. Obviously, based on her Mrs. Doubtfire makeover, he does, and I think she's in India at least. Now, we didn't get to see any Tiffany and Frederick this week, so let's go on to Mill A. Washington and meet up with Corey. I am a little bored with this one. It's just that their love story to me is not all that crazy out of the norm. I think they're dramatizing a little bit, but I gotta tell ya, I was getting choked up right alongside Mother Corey when she was looking at Corey when he said, I'm going to be moving away for good permanently. And she said, 
you're my first baby. You know, if that did not tug at your heartstrings, if you are a mother, I don't know what will. Because if the day that my son leaves me for another woman, I'm not going to be like Debbie and Colt, but it is going to hurt, you know? I mean, just remembering the days when I had my little googie bear, you know, like right now I have to bribe him so I can squeeze his little butt cheekies when no one's looking and I give him little kisses on his soft little chubby cheeks because he doesn't have any stubble. I made him from scratch. I should at least get to do that until it becomes really weird and awkward and he doesn't accept my dollar for a little squeezy. Will I support my son when he grows up or even now doing the presidential push-up test in the hallway of a medical building? Uh, Short answer, no. I know people have a fear of needles, okay? Let's just jump to it because that was really the meat, oh, the arm meat of Corey's segment. He's afraid of needles. And luckily, no one in my family has that fear. So it is a little different to me. But even saying that, Corey took this to like a whole new level of fear of needles. Laying down on the ground, panting and cringing. What does he think it's like for Evelyn to have sex with him if that tiny, itty bitty, little gauge needle makes him weak in the knees? Like he's got to have an any, right? Like an any penis. And maybe, maybe that's why Evelyn wants him to move to Ecuador, right? Because a lot of those places in Central and South America, plastic surgery is a lot cheaper. He's probably going down there so he can get his little any penis fixed. That's got to be it. That's the truth of it all. That's why he's going there permanently. Because he can't come back because his mom is probably like me. She wants to squeeze his little butt cheekies. Okay, no. I was just going to say his mom would notice that there, that he does not have an any anymore. But I do not go near my son's privacies. That's what we call it in my family. No one looks at your privacies unless the doctor asks you. And even then, mom, make sure it's okay. Yes, I know. I'm like the mom in the Goldbergs. I have been told not only for my kids, but my friends. Anyhow, I just think, yeah, Corey's got to get over this shit, especially because he lives in, what, Mill A, Washington? Isn't like legal marijuana and all that kind of stuff legal in Washington? I mean, he's got to be able to like find some medical bark that he can chew on to chill the fuck out when he goes for a shot, right? It's it's a lot. Now let's talk about, oh God, you know who's up next? Paul and Karini. Now this couple I call bullshit on. Karini was absolutely stifling a laugh and a smile that entire time that she was talking to Paul. Paul was saying, oh, I can't come. And she was going, why, Paul? Why? You lied before. Wipe nose over and over because no tears are forming in my eyes. It was complete bullshit. Also, let's point out the fact that we should not even be talking about Paul changing his flight and all this luggage kind of shit because he could have shipped his goddamn luggage down to Brazil and it would have gotten there in less than 30 days. And you know I get far too involved at that codependent thing, blah, blah, blah. So I spent at least 25 minutes, I paused the show to go look it up before I came on here and sounded like an asshole if I was wrong. I spent at least 25 minutes looking up different shipping logistics places. I was looking up DHL, there's a couple private ones, you know, FedEx, the whole rigmarole. Moral of the story is there are companies that do this and it is completely possible. So this leads to my theory I think Paul was expecting production to step in there at the airport on the spot and offer to like pay the difference for him to ship his stuff or to charter some private flight because we all know by now Paul is capable of this diva behavior. We have heard of it off screen, we have seen it on screen, and we've seen his temper tantrums at the airport towards his mom. Now, speaking of his mom... Does Mother Paul have a torso? I mean, I know that sounds mean, but her legs are so fucking long. They're like modelish long. You never see where they actually attach to her body. It's like she's got like no crotch Nile legs, just like legs, a neck, and a head, and a really sweet smile that does not deserve all the shit that Paul gives her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. See, this is the karma. This is why I get the karma that I get, all right? I'm admitting it. Now, let's fast forward to Paul leaving and fuck him for trying to put a guilt trip on his mom. 
him saying, oh, I'm sorry, I wish that I earned more. I wish that I made more money so I could stay here. That was absolutely his last ditch attempt to just grab at his mom's heart and make her do what he wants her to do, which is give him all the fucking money that she has. Let's be real here. If all his mom can give him is a necklace and a lock of her hair, then she certainly does not have enough money to spare to support you and your wife and your baby. I'm not only annoyed with Paul, like I despise him. Just to be able to do that to your mother and the way that he treats everyone, it's... I guess the only thing you can say is like grow up. That is absolutely immature behavior. 30-some-year-olds, even 20-some-year-olds do not act that way. I'm so over Paul. Let's get him off the fucking show. I'm over it. Now, Laura, Laura, she is absolutely my favorite. Hands down, really, literally, bingo, we have a winner. She's a gift. And not a gift like TLC typically gives us, like an Angela of Angela and Michael or a Nicole and as in, I'm not even going to say Paul in there because we've established that I hate him now. I'm just thoroughly enjoying Laura. I don't want it to end. I love that she's bold. She's unapologetic. She's super tight with her son, you know, like her own little googie bear, just like my little guy. And, you know, if she's going to shave your goddamn head if you cross her, well, I think I just found my new best friend. It's like looking into a mirror of my future. I mean, hopefully minus the catfishing part, because I tell you what, if I found out that my husband was cheating on me and on the internet with that kind of stuff, I'd be cutting a lot more than his hair off. Hashtag redemption for Lorena Bobbitt. If you have not watched that documentary, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Get yourself over there and watch it. Lorena is innocent, you guys. Now, uh, let's talk about Aladdin. I'm completely skeptical of this Tunisia man because it's just so trendy these days. Like, Tunisia is so Pinteresty. It's like the Pinterest of 90 Day Fiance. But here's the difference. Laura and Aladdin have met each other before, and it appears from pictures and how they're both acting with each other that things went well. Now, what worries me the most is not just that he's from Tunisia, just like Mohammed was. It worries me that she's moving to Qatar. And I'm saying Qatar because I have had at least a dozen guys who are in the military, guys who Dave works with, that have lived in Qatar, worked there. And of course, they have to mansplain shit to me when I say Qatar. So not only does it cause alarm bells to ring when Aladdin doesn't correct Laura when she says Qatar, Qatar incorrectly, it just makes me concerned for Laura's safety. What I have learned over the past couple years, especially from one of Dave's co-workers who lived there for quite some time, is that Cutter really is very conservative and Laura is very not conservative. Piggybacking onto this Cutter versus Qatar thing, let's talk about this Aladdin versus Aladdin. I mean, something is up with this guy. Names and countries, it's not the same thing as like a tomato, tomato, potato, potato. You can't just let that shit fly. I mean, why is he going by Aladdin? Has Disney been calling Aladdin, Aladdin all this time? Aladdin, Aladdin, Qatar, Qatar. That's what I'm getting at. It really pisses me off. And it's probably because I'm triggered because my parents have called me Julie and Jill my entire life. And those are my sister's names. I've also been called Judy a few times, which is interesting because there is no Judy in our family. So all in all, what I'm trying to say is I like Laura. I'm concerned for her. Oh, I also like her because she's Canadian. Who doesn't love a Canadian, eh? I mean, this is all about Laura's journey, and I hope she finds happiness. And her son, I mean, how freaking adorable. Next week, it looks like she maybe has a friend or a brother who's a little person. So that should be interesting. And I'm not trying to diss it. You guys know I love my Little People shows. Little People, Big World. Back in the day, there was The Little Chocolatiers. Anyone remember that one? Pretty damn good. All right. Now, let's jump into the show Smothered. Man, I, I'm i just going to... I have to say it. I'm disappointed. I'm really disappointed. Let's just run down the list, and we'll start with Cher and Dawn. Well, you know, I got to love some Dawn, especially if you listen to 90 Day Fiance, Happily Ever Recap. My Patreon people listening to this, you know how I love a Dawn. 
Well, Cher and Don, they're 28 and 59. The daughter, Cher, says she's 28, but I'm pretty sure she's 15. Like, she looks really young. They both have a ton of teeth, like enough teeth for an entire family. I'm kind of afraid that Cher's baby will be one of those babies born with a full grill in its mouth. It's like a very low percentage of babies that have it, but if any baby's going to have it, it's going to be Cher's. I've heard that Cher and Dawn were on either, it was like Dr. Phil or my super sweet 16, something like that. It doesn't shock me at all. I don't care enough to really go back and see what it is because you can see from Dawn's personality, she wants to be on TV. She would die to be like a real housewife of Tampa or Naples, Florida, some kind of bullshit like that. She'd be all over it. Now, the whole thing is, is that Cher is pregnant But her husband, Jared, doesn't want her to tell anyone. They're going to tell all the in-laws at the same time. But Cher and Dawn are so close that she thinks that she should tell her mom first. It's stupid. Well, spoiler alert, fast forward if you don't want to hear this, she tells her mom, she gets her little mug with her pregnancy test in it without her husband knowing. And now it's like this whole big thing. And later on in the series, it's going to be, can my mom be in the delivery room or not? I don't give a shit. I'm happy leaving it where it's at with these two, at least. Now, then we have Angelica, and I believe the mom's name is Sunshi. Angelica is 31, Sunshi is 51, and Mother Sunshi is batshit fucking crazy. They live together, they sleep in the same bed together, and these are the ones that you've seen on the previews that share bath water. Now, you guys, don't go crazy. The reason they do that is because they like to, quote, make the most of their mornings together because they work a lot and they're busy. Why they share the bath water, you ask? Is it because their water bill is high? No, no. It's a matter of respect. Son, she says, when Angelica goes into my bath water, it shows me a bond, a trust. It's just, it's unexplainable. It's it's amazing. Oh, is it? It's amazing for you. Well, you're not the one bathing in her old vagina ass under boob sweat water. It's probably amazing for you because you get the fresh water. It's not like 1862 where you have to like heat up the water in the middle of the kitchen in the metal basin. You get one shower and the cleanest kid goes in first. No, let your daughter take her own damn bath. And what's the point of taking a bath if you're not getting clean? You are going into the bath and coming out dirtier. It's disgusting. Maybe she's trying to like recreate her birth moment with her daughter. Like now she is coming out of my fluids. I I don't know. I'm not even going to ask. It's fucking disgusting. So obviously, Sunshi has some attachment bonding issues. And she has, this is weird. She has a fiance named Brett. Brett lives in Nebraska. I didn't even catch where they live. Oh, I think it's Las Vegas. They live in Las Vegas. Brett lives in Nebraska. He only comes out a couple days a month. And we must have been filming in February because mom says, Brett is coming in on the 11th through the 15th. So we'll have him for Valentine's Day. Um, We will have him for Valentine's Day. What is this? A mother-daughter thruple kind of thing? Well, it's not because daughter Angelica has this boyfriend named Jason. Now, despite the fact that Sunshi has her own fiance, who she says she doesn't even really need, she just wishes that there were a man exactly like her daughter, go figure, Sunshi expects to be invited on every single one of her daughter and Jason's dates. And if she does not get invited, she does this whole pity party thing. We already talked about Mother Debbie and her pity party and how that set me the frick off. So to see Sunshi laying there and she says, is this something that I can come along with? I'm thinking about what I should be doing while you and Jason are go-karting. Do you have any ideas? I don't want to relax. I just get sad when I relax. I get physically ill when you're not here. Like I sweat and I get anxiety. I guess just hopefully next time you're going to invite me. Well... Here we go with what this season arc is going to be. Angelica's boyfriend invites her to move in with him, and she wants to do it. But obviously, since she is like single white female with her daughter, she doesn't want her daughter to move in with him. And it's going to be this whole thing with mom against Jason the whole season long. Again, not really interested. Maybe just like the highlights of them. I don't think I can watch this an hour long every single week. 
Now let's talk about Sandra and Mariah. The mother-daughter relationship with these two, Sandra and her daughter Mariah, who is turning 21, there's something different about it than with our other moms and daughters. They love to party together. They dress really, well, they call it sexy. I don't think it's sexy. I just think it's really trashy looking. They got their boobs done together. Oh, bonding. And there's also a younger sister named Chanel who is gorgeous. I think she's like a more beautiful Brianna from Teen Mom too. She's just absolutely stunning. And she's probably stunning because she just has this beautiful, natural, curly hair and just the confidence that she has without having to expose her body. Man, I mean, that's going to be some weird mommy-daughter issues later when she's grown and she realizes that her mom was not really acting like a mom to her and was really kind of mean to her and condescending. Anyhow, let's talk about Sandra and Mariah. Like I said, Sandra's divorced, but she lives together with her ex-husband named Adrian. And I love this guy. He is the voice of reason. And he's standing in the kitchen at one point. Sandra and Mariah come out of the bedroom and they're trying on their club outfits that they're going to wear to Las Vegas for Mariah's 21st birthday. They are completely sheer. So their nipples are just hanging out and Sandra comes out and she's like, "Ah," and she's wearing tiny underwear, what I consider tiny underwear. But Mariah says, you need to have it X-rated. So she goes behind her mom and just rips her underwear up. It gives her an atomic wedgie, basically. And it's like, oh yeah, now that looks good. Well, it might look good, but now her asshole is probably on fire from the friction she just did there. So they walk out into the family room, sheer as can be, in front of, again, ex-husband and father. No care in the world. Like, hey dad, look at the nipples you made on your grown daughter with her fake boobs. It's fucking weird. Did they think it's weird? No, of course not. They think Adrian is ruining their fun because before he moved back in with them, she and her mom, Mariah and her mom, would walk around butt naked and think it was totally normal. But now, bummer, they have to put on clothes. Again, what damage is this doing to the younger daughter, Chanel? Now, fast forward to this birthday dinner because Mariah is turning 21 and her mom, Sandra, is going to treat her to just this awesome trip to Vegas. They have a night at Black Magic, which apparently is a chocolate Chippendale set up for Mariah. And once again, Adrian is probably sitting there going, what has gone so wrong that my ex-wife and my grown daughter not only do this, but love to tell me about it? I was embarrassed to tell my parents I was pregnant with my daughter after like four years of marriage. I didn't even want them to know that that was a possibility. So to be sitting there at 21, nipples free to the world. Hey, dad, am I cold? You tell me. It is. It just blows my freaking mind. Now, like I said, I think to me, this is kind of like a one hit wonder, a one episode wonder to me don't think I could really get into many other episodes, but if you are going to watch it and something crazy happens, let me know and I'll watch it. Or what you could do is recommend an episode to Amanda and I for Total Request Podcast. Oh my God, we have had some incredible episodes. My stomach hurt so bad after last week's episode that we recorded. Amanda spilled the beans that she was in an episode of Extreme Forensics. I did not know this. She held this out. She was in a true crime reenactment TV show and did not say anything to like anyone she's ever known about it. So if you want to check that out, we have America's Next Top Model coming up, Love After Lockup. I led that episode that is coming out this Friday. That is at patreon.com slash Amanda and Jody. Jody with an I-E, four bucks a month, and you get to tell us what you want us to watch. Make sure you check out Moms on the Rocks coming up this week. I tell you about how I am the feral bunny whisperer and or murderer. You decide. Check that out. That is Moms on the Rocks. And again, check out patreon.com slash realitytvpod. And honestly, thank you so much for all your support. So many of you have reached out to me about your own issues with anxiety and depression and I really appreciate it and go and support our man Dave Bolger at B-O-L-G-5 and at The Sweetest Feminist on Instagram. Hope you guys have a great week. I will talk to you next time. Stay salty.